take it. Uh, you know, I'm from Virginia, and uh, you got to catch people back there about <coughs> lunchtime. <laughs> and I had some things I had to take care of, and they're all gone home now. Yeah. They're all gone home. You know, when I was stationed here, I was the J6, and the only time I could catch the J6 back in the joint staff, uh, which was an Air Force uh, general at the time, Jack Woodward, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a generation or two ahead of me, but but the only time I could catch him, I'd do PT in the morning at 6, and I'd finish my run and come in, I'd get a cup of coffee, and before I did anything, I would sit down and call him because I knew he would be at his desk. He always ate a sandwich at his desk for lunch. And I knew I could get him on the phone, no meetings, no this, no that. He's, I knew he was there. So that was my uh, routine because I knew that if I missed him at 5 or 6 o'clock, <coughs> I'm sorry, around, uh, if I missed him at noon, I wouldn't get him the rest of the day. And so, yeah, sort of uh, worked out that way. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to, hi, nice to meet you. Linda, good to meet you. That's a nice and, and he told me that more than once. Yes, But uh, he also recognized me. This is, is, this is my time to, get, to talk to you. Thank you so much. This is a great little thing here. Of course, by the time so he gets around 1700, 1800, yeah, in fact, he was we're trying to work together now. His day back there. So oh, that's good. That yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was, uh, okay. Are you out here now? So it was difficult yeah. for me to uh, just stay and get that time. Out here, you know, once you start your day, <laughs> you just, I keep asking myself that. Every 15 minutes, no. something going on. Yep, I understand. I'm at that point right now. Welcome back. Oh, so I told all of you earlier that I was in this <laughs> Bay, and, and I won't name who it was, but one of you asked me uh, about what's it like to be in the Episcopalian, so I thought I'd tell you this story. <laughs> Since they're, I'm the only Episcopalian in the room, I can get away with this without uh, getting written up by somebody somehow. So there was this, uh, this is the leadership forum. Welcome. <clears throat> so there was this Episcopalian. <clears throat> Everybody heard of Stone Mountain in Atlanta, Georgia? Well, Stone Mountain has, is a giant rock that's been thrust up out of the Earth's surface <clears throat> in an area that's relatively flat. I mean, it's really a, a ge geological phenomenon. But it's got a rounded top, but very steep sides. It almost looks like sort of like that Devil's Tower thing. I mean, it's really a, a sharp, sharp descent. And so this Episcopalian was up on top, and he was more curious than he should have been, and he walked over to the side and he looked down and he looked down a little further and he lost his footing and fell over the side of the mountain. And just before he fell to a certain death, he reached out and grabbed the only little sprig of pine growing out of a crack in the rock. And he's holding on to dear life and he hollers up, help, 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 can somebody help me? <clears throat> no answer. And he's hanging there and he's getting desperate and his grip is beginning to loosen and he calls out again, help, help. Can somebody help me? And this big, deep, calm voice answered, I'm here. I can help you. And not recognizing this almost superhuman voice, this deep, calm voice, he said, Who are you? And the voice answered, I'm God. And he said, well, God, can you help me? And God said, yes, I can help you. Just let go. And I will help you. And Episcopalian thought about it for a minute and hollered up. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> so that's my Episcopalian joke. You can tell it in church, in Episcopal church. <laughs> if you're ever around there. So this afternoon, you're in for a real treat. Another Virginian is here today. By the way, I should probably mention this to all of your guest speakers, uh, including myself, all came from off island to be here with you. So um, I just want you to know that they, they all went to the extra effort 
from Amy to our next speaker, every one of them all came from various places in uh, the mainland to uh, be here on the islands uh, with you for the leadership forum. Just wanted you to know that. So your next speaker for session two, to kick things off, uh, has a military background. Uh, you, you have access to his bio. Uh, perhaps you've already looked at it. Jamie Holcomb uh, was uh, a young military officer, I think I will. Uh, I like computer them. science, communications expert, uh, okay. Okay. did his time in, in the Army, went out into the business world, worked his way okay. up no through uh, the business ranks as they are, and uh, has been chief operating officer and president of major companies. Uh, in the United States, and I'll let Jamie cover some of that oh, detail yeah, with you. Right. Right. But more importantly, after a okay. very, very successful uh, career as a business leader, he returned to public service, and he's now the chief information officer for the Patent and Trademarks uh, Organization. Uh, we refer to them as PTO. And this is a very, very big job, as you can imagine. America's intellectual uh, Secrets, their, its intellectual depth, its really its intellectual power is vested in how well uh, things get patented and then protected um, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Cool. And I'm sure Jamie may, will share some of those stories, but he's got a tremendous challenge ahead of him uh, in modernizing the PTO office and to some degree dragging it, kicking and screaming <laughs> into the 21st century. Uh, so that uh, his agency can, in fact, do the best job possible to uh, not only manage uh, the patent and trademarks uh, side of our government's uh, business, but to protect all of that information. It's a really, really huge task. It's a great honor to introduce you now to Mr. Jamie Holton. Jamie? Thanks a lot, General Brian. Well, wow, I could blow out the speakers, right? Um, leadership and management, something else, right? But it's got to be personal. If it's not personal, it's not real. Next slide, please. As you can see, as General Brian said, I actually graduated West Point, first one ever in computer science. I don't know if that's good or bad, because it took the 1985 to get a, sci a computer science guy out of the academies. But anyway, I went out and uh, first assignment, Schofield Barracks. Outstanding, right? <laughs> I found myself on Team Spirit on the DMZ tuning 1950 radio sets. What the heck did I get into? Right? It's crazy. But you can see the education there, the Army career, and also what I wanted to say is leadership and management is the same in industry. And you can see that I have where those stars are, that's government, and where they're not, that's industry. Now it's funny because in between the last two stars there, Harris actually is a government contractor. Probably the most signal communication friendly organization you want to talk about. We had those great Harris radios. In fact, one of the things I love is that Tom Cruise movie I don't know, it, uh, I forget what it was, but anyway, it was a something in the future, and uh, nuclear holocaust and everything else, you know, the aliens came in, and he's going down to Manhattan, right? And he sees the Empire State Building all covered and everything else. He gets to the top, and the Harris radio is still working. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, right? I don't know if, that, if you guys remember that movie, but look for Harris. It's a great radio set. You can run it over with a tank, and it still works. See, I still love my old company. It's really great. I, tell you, I can tell you, Jamie, in, in special operations, we had hundreds of Harris radios, and we didn't even monitor the maintenance status on them because they never broke. It's awesome. I love it. And, and I American don't stock made. at Harris, but I, but I, I depended on them. Exactly. So anyway, I've had a good career. I really like where I'm at in the world, and I decided, uh, and again, if it's not personal, it's not real, right? So the fact of the matter is, I've been married for 33 years, and I have four children. 
And I guess the biggest challenge in leadership has actually been the family. <laughs> My God. You know, you think about it, the best job I've ever had is father. And it's a very challenging job because you're never right and never wrong. And that applies then in leadership and management, right? You can manage the heck out of your family, but if you don't lead it, it could fail. And that's what we're going to talk about here, okay? Next slide, please. You manage things and you lead people. That was part of the course curriculum when you came in here. Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. I don't know if you know, know her. I actually saw her give a speech at West Point, which was fantastic. I walked up to her afterwards and so forth. She was one of the ones that actually, in a log entry book in 1947, recorded the first software bug. A moth had uh, actually fell in between two relays. <laughs> and so she recorded that, and that's the so first software. So she, God rest her soul, is she still around? I don't think no. so. I think God she's rest passed. her soul, right? But I remember the one thing I remember in that, right? The things that leave an impression in your mind, which is great. She was talking about how we can think about things. How can you think about a million or a billion? If you've ever heard her talk about this, this is fantastic because she gave out pieces of string that were 11.173 inches long. And do you know what that represented? The amount, or I'm sorry, the length that light would travel in one nanosecond. And it just blows your mind when you think about it. In one nanosecond, light travels that fast. And that's what she used to give out. So, hey, she's still in my memory today in doing that. That is an example of a leader, somebody who impresses that upon yourself, right? Because that image is still in my mind. So if it's not personal, it's not real. She made it personal for me, and she made it reality at a very young age. As parents, we don't understand the impressions we make on our children. It's just phenomenal, the things we do and say, how years later they come back. So the fact of the matter is, everything you do counts. So think about that with leadership and management. You manage things and you lead people. One of the things I like to think about is, when you're leading people, you lead with your heart. When you manage things, you lead with your head. So that's one of the ways I separate the two. And I want to get some discussion here, too, about what's going on. It's a fairly small group, so it's easy to have some good discussion. Um, oh, by the way, neither is sufficient and both are necessary. Right? You can't have one without the other, and we're going to talk about that. And you can see it's both sides of the same coin. Next slide, please. All right, actions, your vision, you have to show the way. Whatever it is that we're doing, it's all about accomplishing the mission. If you don't show the people the way, you're not leading. Also, you need to talk story. Now, that's a, a Hawaiian saying. How many people have actually been stationed in Hawaii? Hua. So I was here at Schofield Barracks for three years and at Fort Chapter for three years. I was tactical and then I was strategic. And uh, God bless General Renzi. Mm. <laughs> he was a big leadership impact on my life as well. And so everybody in Hawaii who does communications knows General Renzi, or at least from our era. Well, there's a scholarship named after him here in the chapter. So that's awesome. When you talk story, you story the path. You show the way, and you talk about the way. As we all know, Army, hurry up and wait. Navy, it's sort of similar. I mean, they actually have food that's good. And the Air Force, I don't know, that's the most civilian of the branches, but it's okay. It's all good. You got to have that rivalry, because if you don't, right, it's, it's no fun. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, whenever you're waiting in line, it's always hurry up and wait. If you're not able to talk story, if you can't tell somebody and, and entertain yourselves, you could go crazy. Well, that's the same way when anybody's doing a mission, whether it be in the military or in industry. You've got to be able to tell the story. You've got to have a beginning, middle, and end. And it should be at least entertaining, if not have an impact on some lessons learned. Also, 
when you're aligning the team to the path, you're declaring boundaries. That's the whole thing about a vision. A vision is not just, you know, let's go out and do this. It's here's the path we're choosing. And not only are the path, but what are the boundaries? And what happens when you go outside the boundaries or stay in the boundaries? So you have to think about that as well. You adapt. You need to course correct along the way. You have to create a culture of working together or you don't have a team. And the one that I love, no, come on in. No worries. The uh, measurement of leadership. If you lead with the heart, how do you measure that? Because, as I said, the family is the biggest thing that I've ever done, right? How do you measure love? I mean, I haven't found a unit of measure yet. And if you ask my wife, I'm, I don't have that much. You know. Anyway, another story altogether. But everything that counts can't be counted. Einstein said that. And I think that's very, very true. There is analog measurement without having digital units. And you have to think about that when you're actually progressing along the path and trying to say, yeah, we did well or no, we didn't. So how, who here has measured progress for leadership, and how do you measure that? We're gonna, that's going to be an exercise at the other end of this. Right. So I'm, I'm prepping you for that course. Next slide, please. Leadership traits. Inspirational, charismatic, good interpersonal skills, communicates well. All those things are true, right? But just because you have the traits, does that make a leader? You have to think about that hard. Next slide. So, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Ooh. Little discussion. Now, there's from different eras up there. I didn't know what the class composition would be. So, Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump. Wow. Talk about two ends of the spectrum. Good leadership, bad leadership qualities in each. Anybody care to take a dare on measurement of leadership? Were they charismatic? Were they inspirational? Or you can choose one of those things. I mean, I'm sorry, choose one of the others. There's a lot of examples here. And I will say, I knew I'm going to get people to think. I want to go back to Jimmy Carter. But the fact of the matter is, Bryce Harper in the World Series. Why do I bring him up? He, in, in, in and of himself, is a great baseball player. was on the Nationals. All right? Nationals did not win a pennant when Bryce Harper was part of the team. Then Harper goes away, and all of a sudden, they win the World Series. Whoa. Was it because he left? Why couldn't he lead them to a championship? What prevented them? from actually coalescing as a team, all right? In my case, I will tell you, I believe that it was a superstar syndrome. If you have one person that just outshines everyone else, then they can't function together as a working team very well. And it's not that Bryce did anything wrong. It's that he was almost too good. It didn't fit. The chemistry wasn't there. So as a leader, you also have an obligation to understand what chemistry is and how to make the team work together very well. So going back to Jimmy Carter now, what, what type of leadership traits did he have that is obvious to everyone? I mean, right now he's a uh, philanthropist. He's got the whole, I'm sorry, uh, thing, Habitat for Humanity. At 95 years old, oldest president ever to live to 95, fell down, smashed his face, got back up and is at work the next day. Hoo -ah. Naval Academy grad, I'll give it to him. It's okay. It's still good. He was a new guy, wasn't he? He was. And it's so funny that, Cher I'm sorry, not Chernobyl, but um, uh, Three Mile Island, thank you. Three Mile Island occurred under Jimmy's watch. How did he lead the country out of that one? Does everyone know Three Mile Island? No. <laughs> there was a, everyone know Chernobyl? Oh, wow. So, a nuclear power plant had its core reactor uh, go, um, what was that called? The right term, critical mass. So it blew itself up on the inside. 
Luckily, the containment contained it, but a lot of the um, steam and water were actually radioactive, and it was spilled into the surrounding community. That's what happened at Three Mile Island. It was contained, but it did some of the water got out. At Chernobyl, it wasn't as good. In Russia, in Chernobyl, it really went critical mass where it just spread out in the atmosphere. So, how did Jimmy Carter lead out of Three Mile Island? Anybody remember that? Communicated? Made sure everybody was understanding of what was going on? But he had to have some confidence, and I like the, what you brought up, Joe. The fact of the matter is, he was a nuke, so he spoke with authority. He was a nuclear engineer. And because of that, you could trust him. So that's another thing about a leader. You have to be able to trust their competence. If a leader does not have competence in whatever choice he makes, whatever he's leading, it's very hard to believe him and then get the requisite teamwork together. Think about that. Bill Belichick. Who likes that guy? Nobody. <laughs> so he's not very charismatic. Is he a good leader? Yeah. Must be. I mean, the results are there, right? So we do have a choice in what type of leader we want to be as well. I mean, if winning is the only thing that matters, Bill Belichick is your example of leadership. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, think about those guys. What leadership traits do they have? Anyone? Vision. Say it? Vision. Oh, my gosh. Steve Jobs thinks different, or thought, God rest his soul, right? God, uh, he thought differently than everybody else. Has anybody heard about the story about how he got the iPad, iPod smaller. Anybody read his book? It's, it's a good read, but he was not very satisfied with his design team. He looked at this iPod 2, I believe, or what it was. It was big. And he's like, we got to make this smaller. And it just does not, doesn't have the ergonomics that I like. It doesn't have the feel that I need. And he goes, Steve, look, you just don't get it. We've done all this research. We've worked on this for 18 months. There's no way we can squeeze any more out of this. Jobs got so upset with everything, thinking differently. He took the iPod, walked over, and there was a little aquarium. He threw it in the aquarium, or dropped it, and all of a sudden, bubbles came up. He goes, that means there's air in there. I know there's more uh, I know we can compress it. I know it can be tighter. I know it's too big. Fix it. And walked out the room. Is that leadership? Sure. Great story, right? Would you like to work for him? Hell no. I mean, he was a son of a gun. He really was. Look at his uh, Wozniak right beside him the whole time, right? Did he treat Steve Wozniak very well? Not at all. Not a nice guy. Leader. Visionary. Again, you have a choice on how to lead. And history shows us. And he, oh, I get, being the West Point guy, studying all the uh, Civil War ad infinitum. Sorry, I apologize. Anybody want to talk about Grant and Sherman? Think about their leadership? Anybody know anything? I mean, just, just throwing it out there. Well, we got to say again. Yeah, that's true. Grant. Dead Sweet. Knowledgeville. All right, that's what it would be. You know why he's on there? He was a president. You're right. Um, he also won the Civil War for the Union. And he produced what we call modern warfare based on the American way to fight after Napoleon. And he also brought into the fact of total war, where it wasn't just good enough to kill the enemy forces. You had to actually kill the whole society. You had to take total war into account because everything was thrown in there. And Sherman was the guy that made it happen. One worked in the West, one worked in the East. Sherman's raid on Atlanta and the burning of Atlanta and then his march to the sea totally decimated the South, took away their economic base from which they could not wage war any longer. That's leadership at all costs. 
And when you think about having to make such a decision, because actually Sherman was sympathetic to the South. He was stationed in the South. He loved America so great. And yet, Grant and him devised a strategy where they would win. The reason he wanted to kill everything and do total war was the fact that he wanted to make this war less. He knew that uh, we had gone two years and killed so many people because they wouldn't commit. Much like today, where we have people never wanting to die, never, you know, never wanting to put harm's way, never wanting to have blood and treasure. But you have to be strong and you have to get away. So that was his leadership and the vision of total war. And that's why I put them up there as examples. All right, next slide. Does leadership guarantee success? No, not at all. Robert E. Lee, study in the Civil War again in Gettysburg. It's a great study. But if it wasn't for one man, the South may really have won. And that man is Robert E. Lee. He would not listen to his commanders. And he did fight a Napoleonic war. He didn't realize that the war footprint had changed. And he didn't adapt to the situation. Example of bad leadership and the whole thing about listening. So you have, you know, he was a great leader and yet he was uh, leading on an old paradigm. So the big thing to think about in this class is what are those leadership things and values that stand the test of time and don't change? Because if you don't change, you're going to lose. But you want to keep those things that are true to you inside in order to execute and accomplish the mission. I could talk all, Douglas MacArthur is another one. Let's go with a uh, sports analogy, though. Who knows Joe Gibbs? Washington Redskins coach during the 80s, during the 90s. Big difference. What happened? Same guy, different results. They won the Super Bowl, but then in the 90s, he couldn't get them off the dime. They were a terrible team. Did he change his leadership? Was he a different man? No. In my opinion, when you think about this, the underlying assumption of sports had changed, and he didn't adapt to that. In the 80s, it was all about your home team and being homebred and having the family around you. And that's what he purported in his locker room and in his coaching staff and so forth. And as a family, the Redskins got together, and as a team, they worked together. In my opinion, in the 90s, what happened was it was the years of the superstar where you had to have the best quarterback or the best running backs or the best receiver. And he didn't do that. He didn't adapt. And therefore, the Redskins never really came to four in his second um, staunch at uh, being a coach. Comments, questions? You can disagree with me. I'm trying to make things. There you go. Why aren't you getting somebody inside? Why aren't you getting the superstar? Come on. I mean, I don't think the current NFL where, you know, you, you lose a couple of games, you fire the coach. I don't think that's a good one. So how would you address his current success in the generation? Thank you. Obviously, if I said what I said about the 80s, and he changed his venue from football to NASCAR, why is Joe Gibbs so successful at NASCAR? He understood that the underlying values of the sport are his values as well. Family, hometown, loyalty, dedication, sports. So that's why Joe Gibbs succeeds in the NASCAR, because it matches his personal leadership style. Has anyone read Joe Gibbs' book? It's a great book. You should read it. It's all about how to be a better person. And in it, he goes through, these are mine. They don't necessarily have to be yours, but here's some objective values that you should really look into. And I do say it's a great book to read. Oh, so what about the other side of the coin? Management. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I throw Bobby Knight up there because he was at West Point, basketball coach. Who knows Bobby Knight? Please, I've talked enough. Could you? <laughs> I think one of the most famous things Bobby Knight has done, and you can look up a YouTube on this, he got so angry during his, his coaching style was authoritarian at best, abusive at worst. The most famous YouTube video of him is taking a seat, a uh, chair, and throwing it across the um, court at another player because the player wasn't performing well. So he coached through an intimidation. Now, he was successful in the beginning, but again, in my estimation, my analysis, fear can only go so far in leading a team to success because you're fraying things at the end. You're asking people to be on edge all the time. Fear is a good short-term motivator, a very poor long-term motivator. Just my, uh, my assessment. Anybody see that in the military? Yeah. How about those flaming... Uh, thank you, Cheetos. There you go. We all know them, right? I never forget, uh, I was in, it was in the Kahukus up here. New second butter bar, second lieutenant butter bar, out there doing the jungle stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, go. Oh, through the woods and everything, or through the jungle. Come up, and there's a major, S3, berating his uh, senior captain because the guy wasn't in proper uniform. And it wasn't like he took him to the side. He was berating him in front of the whole top, the tackle operations center. What a jerk. That type of leadership does not work. And, and it hurt me to see the captain because I really respect him. And that is the thing that can destroy unit cohesion and teamwork. So you have to be very careful about authoritarian rules. Thanks a lot. Bobby Knight is that example. All right, so what about the other side of the coin, management? We've talked a lot about leadership. What is management? Next slide, please. All right, what are management actions? Now, I will tell you, because I have some industry in me, right? You lead from the heart, and you manage from the brain. I love going to Chaminade University, right over here in Honolulu, Hawaii, where I got my MBA. And I got it because I needed to understand the basics of business. If you know anything, Sherman and Grant and all those other guys that are great officers failed miserably <laughs> as businessmen. All right? It's a different skill set. And the reason is because it's not the same skill set. In management, you have to be actually competent at what you're doing. And if you're not, it'll show through because you can't convince people to buy your goods. And the simple matter is, and when you manage things, use PPT. I'm sure everyone has heard of this before. If not, PPT doesn't stand for PowerPoint. It stands for people, process, and tools. And when you manage, everything boils down to people, process, and tools. I don't care what you talk about. It boils down to people, process, and tools. Those are the three categories you can put everything in. And so when you talk about management actions, you actually have to do these things in order to do it well. You have to organize people for op optimal output. That is what the job of HR is. Put the right person in the right place at the right time. That's managing. It has nothing to do with leading. It's recognizing it. It's understanding the competence. It's knowing your people. It's a big deal. You don't put somebody who doesn't like to deal with numbers as your finance guy. Wrong. You don't put the finance guy in charge of logistics. He's doing numbers. Logistics requires supply and cues and so on and so forth. You have to know what you're doing. Create efficient processes. A process is a checklist. Easy, right? But some checklists are really poor. Other checklists are very good. The Air Force is notorious for checklists. I got out of the military and went over to the NRO. Our National Reconnaissance Office flies all of our spy satellites. I can't believe I'm saying that. Right? I realized I could say it after I went back and all that stuff I signed away, 
all of a sudden was unclassified with this big sign, National Reconnaissance Office. I'm like, what the heck? Anyway, what I learned, though, was when you went in from the Army into the Air Force realm, because it really, the NRO was started by a bunch of Air Force guys, everything was a checklist. Damn. It was all about process. And why? It's easy. Before you get in the plane to fly it, you do your checklist. You walk around, you make sure you do everything. It's an easy way to do satellites. It's an easy way to blast rockets. So because of that, I learned a heck of a lot from the Air Force. So when you create processes, you can create good ones or bad ones. You've got to know what you're doing in order to create a good one. Deploying tools and technology. And why do you deploy them? To complement or amplify your people and process. There is too much going on right now where people think that technology and tools can solve everything. It can't. <clears throat> Sorry. We have obligations as leaders to ensure folks know, no, the web cannot solve all of your problems. No, you can't put out on social media the ability to fly satellites. It doesn't work. So you have to put the right tool and the right technology in place at the right time. And it's supposed to amplify your people and processes. It doesn't necessarily have to replace them, although industry likes to do that. Why? It takes money away. The most expensive component in any industry in America is the people. The people labor is the most expensive cost. Joe and Brian mentioned I work at the PTO. $3.6 billion each year is collected in fees from trademarks and patents. $2.4 million, a billion of those dollars go to examiners. What? We have 8,200 patent examiners and 1,200 trademark examiners. They are a special class. They're even above GS level. Look at, that's a lot of money going out to a lot of people. My current role is to figure out how to make that better because I believe that better, cheaper, and faster, well, I got to make it better. I just said that. Cheaper, I think it costs way too much money to apply for a patent. Then you apply for it, it takes two years to get, and they tell you, no, somebody else already did it. Yes, there is a huge checklist that's very bureaucratic. And if you've ever tried to apply for a patent and or a trademark, the first thing that someone will tell you, get a lawyer. Why? Because you will most likely be unsuccessful without having someone who's been through the process before try to give you that patent or trademark. And you don't want to waste money, so most likely you'll hire a lawyer. You can. I tried. It's like a mess. Like it is. And, right. And that's what I'm trying to combat. That's the better part. Because I'm taking a mission to do something for the general public for entrepreneurs to be able to do patents and trademarks on their own. Should we be able to do it with a checklist and a you know, web form? Yes. Are we able to do it right now? No. But that's something that as a leader and manager... I have to use both that I can do with my 2,200-person organization. What? I have 625 feds and 1,600 contractors working for me. That's crazy. I never had that much in the military. That's nuts. We need to do things better, cheaper, and faster. And you can see it. That's managing. But in order to manage well, you have to lead out of the funk. Right now, everybody's like, <laughs> Now, what does the IRS currently use for most of its processing power? Negative. Mainframe COBOL tools. Even, even, even older than that. And guess what? They work. Why don't they replace them? Because they work. Why mess around with something that doesn't work? Now, the problem is, 
It was never designed for a self-service community. So you're going to have to, the IRS's biggest problem is they have to figure out how to do self-service. But I'm glad you brought it up. That's really good. And I think that's another thing. Leaders make people think differently. A big point. If they don't think differently, you're going to do the same things over and over again. You've got to think differently. You've got to get out of the morass and do that. Whew, I got a little away from the PPT. You can read all that. But again, at the bottom, your measures, all right? Better, cheaper, and faster. Better is mo- uh, measured through quality. Faster, of course, is time. Cheaper, of course, is with dollars. But time is money. So that's another component as well. Now, the following, the one on the bottom is for those who've never managed or led before. The fact of the matter is you can only inspect what you expect. If you do not inspect, you'll never get your expectations met. Trust but verify. Who said that? Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Best president ever. Ooh, I'm not supposed to make those type of statements. (laughs) Okay, very good. I can do that. Next slide, please. Some of the traits for a manager. Attention to detail, all in the numbers. Follow the money. Better, cheaper, faster. Show me and prove it. I don't believe it. And finally, you have to measure objective progress. Where leading might be more subjective, managing is definitely objective. On it. Put it down in the books. Next slide, please. Managers, are they infamous rock stars or not? Who knows Moneyball? Who thinks Moneyball is sacrilegious? <laughs> Why? Because it takes that whole heart out of the game. It's all about numbers at that point. I mean, it's a brilliant way to, to team up. Who, who, I'm sorry, who has... Okay. Moneyball is the concept, and Paul uh, D. Podesta is the one who did it for the Oakland A's athletic. He actually came in and found out how to organize a baseball team by getting the right people in the right positions based on their numbers and their performance rather than anything else. Uh, Nothing to do with chemistry, nothing to do with superstar status or nothing. It was all in the numbers. And price. And price. That's correct. Exactly. So Moneyball is an example of a great manager. Right? All in the numbers. Now, did the Oath Math Wellex win for a long time? Yeah, it worked. It, it is. Is that the way you want to play baseball? I don't know. I mean, you have to decide that for yourself. <laughs> All right. How about Robert McNamara? How about that? His management at Ford made him supposedly a good candidate and accepted the nomination as Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War. How'd that work out? Not very well, because the numbers that he was talking about when he was at Ford were units of cars sold. Excellent. The numbers that he talked about were Vietnam were body count, the enemy and ours. Not so good. My opinion, McNamara was not the right man for the job. Jamie Dimon, have you seen him? All about the money. Exactly. When pressed, do CEOs get paid too much? Would not answer. Because he knows, he's not stupid, he knows it's all about the money. And if you took away the money from the CEOs, they wouldn't be there. They'd be doing something else. Interesting, right? Al Chainsaw Dunlap. Who knows who he is? Ooh, see, I might have stumped you on this one. No, no, nothing to do with that. Okay. A, um, the reason I put him up there is he is a West Point graduate. However, he was called Chainsaw Al because he came in and blew things up. The way he managed was to come in, blow it up, put it all together, and make it look better on numbers. That's right. He invented the nuclear option. You look him up. It's a good study. Do you want to follow that type of manager? Probably not. And, of course, you know, the two rock stars right there, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, one 
does have a following. The other, not so much. Who do you, who do you think has the following? Musk. You know he almost went bankrupt? Isn't that great? Great story, right? His heart is in it, too. So he has that leader manager. Now, Zuckerberg, his heart's in it? Don't know. I don't know what the man's intent is, but I see him talk in front of Congress, and I don't see a very sincere man. My opinion, my opinion alone. All right? If he was sincere, you'd see a little passion behind it. There'd be something in it. I see, as you stated, just a robotic answer. So it's also interesting in this comparison of you've got Elon Musk, who's a very charismatic guy. He's like, hey, we're going to make a flamethrower that's totally not a flamethrower. Buy it on our website that's totally not a flamethrower.com. Like, you've got that mentality. And then you've got Mark Zuckerberg, whose entire claim to fame is I need a social media. That's why the both sides of the coin, what is right, what is wrong. It's all of us to choose at the time we make those decisions. I totally agree. Side note, Elon Musk just shot like 60 satellites into nowhere order, orbit last week. Hua. And uh, everybody here in Hawaii thought that you don't know what you're doing. Because <laughs> you can see him. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Now, it's interesting you say that, too. This can get into a whole discussion about the founders. The founders wrote the Constitution for Checks and Balances, looking at all the past civilizations and how to combat exactly that. Because the only reason Rome didn't work, according to the founders, was because the mob took over. And people were able to get the passionate mob to go one way or the other. And they knew that representative government needed to have a voice for the minority as well as the majority. The mob should not rule over. When you say majority and democratic rule, just because you have a number of people, you know, um, what is it? The French killed 30 million of their countrymen in the French Revolution. That doesn't mean they were right. A majority of them wanted all those people killed. It, say again? Hence the Electoral College. It was the way to do the checks and balances in order that the minority had a say in actually what happened. So that's interesting. In your leadership and management then, how do you ensure that those people who are on the line know really what's going on, have a voice in saying the decisions being made at the corporate board? That's what people are asking. Because there's very little do we have in a corporate governance where there's checks and balances. 
Everything usually rests on the head of a command and control environment where it's all in the CEO's head. Maybe there is a need for a, t a representative type of corporation, a public-private trust in, so in, in a way. It's a little philosophical, but it all goes down to leadership and management. Next slide, please. So, two sides of the same coin. Here we go, and here's some intersection. This is where I want to get most of the talk about because this is where it all comes together. In my opinion, the things that you need to be good at both adapting, inspiring, listening, storytelling, valuing people, and what they call grit. That is good. That could be on the lead side. Or it is the value people. Compassion and empathy are great things that great men have. Jimmy Carter, in my mind, has compassion and empathy for people. That's why he does what he does. So I think that maybe should be up there. I like that. That's a good point. Is that under lead or manage? Or is it in the both? In the both. It, no, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Heart and head. I like that. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I like, and then in the middle where it goes down, you can point to all the things. Yeah. I like that. That's good. I know. It's black and white. It's that way on purpose. I want the class to color in the story. Right? You've heard that before. Put some color into it. Right? So I did that purposely. There was some color in this before. And I didn't want that. I wanted it to be bland. I wanted to say, you have the right to imprint your own personal philosophy on leadership and management. Because each one of us can only do what comes from inside. If you try to do somebody else's leadership, you will fail. There's no doubt in my military mind. I am a soldier. You can take the boy out of the army, but you cannot take the army out of the boy. I will always be a soldier just that's the way it is. That's the way I think. When I approach a countryside, I'm looking for the high-speed avenues of approach. I'm looking for the reconnaissance sections where I need to put my retrans. I know what satellite shots need, and I know the angle that they need to go at. I, I can't help it. I race cars for fun. Everybody has their thing, right? I build and race cars because nobody can yell at me. I know it's black and white, and if I wreck, it's my fault, not anybody else's. Anyway, what do you think about some of these uh, examples? I love the point about empathy is missing, missing, compassion is missing. Let's put that in there. What about the measurement of things? How do you measure grit? I like that. Well, well, that's true, too. That's, that's the um, uh, movie embodiment. You hear that one? Just be around. Exactly. Persistence, perseverance. Engagement. Engage. Well, what's the... Okay, so here's the one. I love that one. There's a fine line between stubbornness and perseverance. What's, what is the line? How do you know that you're... Is, do the ends justify the means? I, everybody has a judgment about that, right? So it all depends upon the situation that you're in, how stubborn or persevering you are. I love that because the grit part is no matter what life is telling you, you get back up and you do it again. That's grit. Doesn't matter. You get back up and do it again. Yeah, but you're stupid. Why do you keep doing the same thing? Why do you keep bouncing your head, head against the wall and it bleeds? That's pretty stupid. Don't do that again. Okay, maybe adapt. But adapt and keep doing is the point. Mm, overcome what? There, I like that. That's great. That's a good one. Anything? Grit, it, um, Dan described it good.
Did that make sense? Again, if it's not personal, it's not real. Do you have grit? What have you done in your life that you've overcome time and time again, even though everybody tells you, don't do that anymore, that's stupid? There you go. They don't have grit. Or they're really not meant for the military. There's, there's, no, you know, there's the compassionate part. Some people are just not meant for some job. And you as a leader need to understand that. And, you know, if, if this guy, I, I've had a lot of finance folks, right? They don't belong doing finance. Maybe they can find a cure for cancer. So, you know, get out. Do that. Stop doing the thing that you're bad at. But is that grit then? Adapting and overcoming. There's no right answer. And I love grits, that's for sure, especially with cheese and sugar. <laughs> cheese and sugar, you gotta love it. I am doing good with time, but I, I'll, I can move on to the next one unless folks want to talk about this a little more. I think so, but you tell me which one is which. That's the way I look at it. Is that the way you look at it, though? Okay, we'll do over beer. And that's interesting, too. I love beer. Ben Franklin said, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> So, I have sat down and had beer with a lot of people. Some people don't like beer. My wife hates beer. So she'll have a wine and I'll have a beer. But when you sit down and break bread or try to come to that commonality and just talk to people face to face, look people in the eye. As a leader, if you don't look people in the eye, people will not trust you. If they think you're hiding anything, if they think you're not fully sincere, you will not be successful. You need to be honest with yourself and honest to everyone else, too. Then you'll be successful as a leader. Next slide, please. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. So on the, um, the Could you go back? In fact, that's a good point. I actually have dealt with the Japanese culture on many fronts, including exchange. The thing is, you cannot prevent, you, you cannot deny that you're an American if you're an American. Respecting another's culture is different. So the thing is to have a mutual understanding when you come together, you look into the eye and say, are you comfortable with that? What is your name and how do you pronounce it? The sweetest thing to anyone's ear is their name. Why is that? Psychological thing. Anybody know? It's personal. What else? I was going to say narcissism. Yeah. There, there's a bit of that there. And, of course, where does that develop? Where is that first? Mothers. When you're raising and your nourishment, everything else is about mom. And when mom calls you that name and you hear that, that's the sweetest sound of your ear forever and always. It will always be. So if you really want to show respect and dignity and relate, you will ask the other person, how do you want me to pronounce your name? And take that to heart. Did that answer your question? Yes. You're welcome. Next slide. Finally, I have two career examples here of leadership and management. One is the fourth chapter company command, the other is the Globex ISP turnaround. I could talk forever about both of them, but I'll talk about the military one first. I walked into a situation at fourth chapter of the telecommunications center, as well as the printing and publication warehouse, as well as base communication in 1988. The company commander, which will go unnamed, was not good. That is a subjective statement that can be verified with fact. 
I came in and did what any normal military officer would do. I expected my troops to perform a certain way. Half of my command were actually GS civilians. I also expected them to act and behave and perform according to standard. The old company commander did not hold the standards I did. When I came down, nobody had fired a weapon in three to six years. Everybody qualified within the first year. PT was not done. Sir, you don't understand. We're communications. We keep the TCC up. We don't have to do that stuff. Yes, you do. Every morning, 6 a.m., out in the quad, we're PT. Sir, we don't have to wear those uniforms. We're down here in the cold. Yes, you do. Not only that, but you'll wear the new uniforms as well, the new camos. And you will have spit shine shoes. Shine, okay, maybe not polished that well. But you need to take pride in yourself. How many have seen the movie Patton? If you haven't, Patton's a great movie. Probably why I joined the, the Army. But anyway, he goes in during North Africa, and he cleans up the command that heretofore had been just all over the place and lacked performance. When you go into a situation, if you have a choice, go into the worst situation you can ever imagine, and then make it better. Seek out those things that are hard. Because why do you want to take something over that somebody has just made perfect? Now, sometimes it's hard even to make something perfect even better. That's a good one. But I like the real challenges where everything's messed up. Fubar. People know what that means? Fouled up beyond all recognition. I like that one, right? How about snafu? I love this. This is great. What's that? Yep, you got it. So the fact of the matter is, if you take one of those situations and make it better, you will get known. And I will tell you, that's the reason I was able to convince the commanding general of Fort Chapter that he needed to hire me instead of requisitioning through the system, because why should he take a chance on somebody coming out of Gordon when I was right there in front of him and I had all the qualifications needed? Guess what? A leader and manager also needs to sell. So not only did I do that, I got this ragtag bunch of soldiers, spit, shine, polish, ready to go. People couldn't believe it. So much so that I got this award from Mrs. MacArthur herself, the Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award. All right? So proof is in the pudding, but the soldiers had prided themselves afterwards, and we did do a lot of great things. The other one I can bring to the point is Globex ISP Turnaround. So whereas my Fort Shafter experience was more from the heart, I had no competence, but it was pretty easy. The Globix ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. They went bankrupt. They were delisted off the NASDAQ. Who talk about something really bad. They were millions, tens of millions in the debt. What do you do? Luckily, I knew about the technology. Luckily, I understood e-commerce, and I went in there, and I went down management, detail, figured it all out, and understood where they went wrong. Pretty much, they didn't understand margin. And business is really easy when you get right down to it. You sell certain things for revenue. You have certain expenses that go against the revenue, and if Revenue less expenses is positive, you're in business. If it's negative, you're not in business. How much simpler can it get? And yet people snafu it all the time. All right? They make wrong investments, and that carries over. And that's what happened. So we stopped the things that were bad. As an example, the salesman found it very easy to sell email subscription service to spammers. Well, yeah, you can take the money, but now you got to put out that spam across the Internet. Since I managed the Internet, most people around didn't do it. Do you know what happens when you put spam out on the Internet and you're one of the providers? Guess what the other providers do? <laughs> you're out. <laughs> So now you're not getting regular traffic, and your traffic ain't getting out. That's not good. What's the first thing I did? 
I went into the situation, much like a room like this, probably 60 people. I said, look, guys, we got to turn into a white hat shop. You know what white hat versus black hat means? Good cop, bad cop. Look, I appreciate that you guys are great hackers. I understand you engineers are awesome, and I respect that. You got 60 days to get your gear and get out. But if you want to be a white hat and you want to actually operate the right way, let's do this together and make this a different company. Five of the 60 left. I'm gonna look at, they were the most notorious. They knew they wouldn't do good in a good environment anyway. Three years later, we turned the company around. We relisted on the Amex, the American Stock Exchange. Everybody was happy because the management of those folk, along with leadership, but you really had to have the confidence to understand what to do. Another little story. There's a lot of, a lot of great stories I could go in forever. I wanted to figure out how to help the troops, compassion, empathy, take pride in what they were doing and get them competitive. Because I know that if you're competitive, you perform at a different level. We did March Madness. CBS is located in Midtown Manhattan. Our headquarters was right down there in Lower Manhattan. We were able to put CBS, um, what's that called, Sweet 16, and all the basketball, the March Madness. We actually streamed it on the internet. That was the paid subscription service through Globix. So I'm like, okay, we're going to get all these calls in the call center and network ops. And I'm going to make sure, we're, I'm going to check these calls here and there and see whichever team does the best and give them recognition and all that other stuff. Awesome, woohoo! I'm giving all these awards and everything. One time I'm Listen to the calls on uh, mid, midnight shift. And I find out that our midnight shift is actually sending our customers to another company for repair. Whose company it was? It was the shift supervisor, along with all his buddies, started a new business. And they were fixing all the things that were broke, not letting Globix get that money. So what do you do when something like that happens? Well, you can't fire everybody. Your operations will go to crap. What do you think I did? Fired everybody. <laughs> You're done. Out. In fact, I had a New York City detective in my deploy. He was retired. He was a facilities guy. He brought in some of his buddies, and I made a big deal of it. I had him walk out, do the perp walk with the, uh, with the handcuffs and everything. Just so everybody saw, we took pictures and everything else to make sure that people knew we weren't going to be taken advantage of. Now, I also had to sit there from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and man the board with the rest of them. But sometimes as a leader, you have to do those things in order to be successful. So that's my time is up, and I wanted to give it back to uh, General Brian here. Thanks, Jamie. <clears throat> So we have uh, uh, a little gift here for you. Um, so on behalf of the AFSIA Hawaii chapter, their chapter coin. No doubt. And on behalf of the Education Foundation, one of our t-shirts, uh, t-shirts, uh, golf shirts for this year, uh, just for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Sir. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie Holcomb. So, you know, I wanted to... Uh, cover a couple of points and then we'll get into the uh, small group exercise here. You know, uh, one of, if you've had a chance to read my paper, I quote uh, a gentleman in there, a good friend by the name of Bill Toady. And uh, Bill is famous for saying, you know Bill? Yeah. He's, he's quite a guy. Uh, has, has a real wry sense of humor. Uh, uh, but, but a great leader and I will say a great business leader. Uh, had a career in the Navy and uh, was, uh, had great success and, and has had great success in business. Why? Because of this quote that he is famous for making. He has known a lot of managers, great managers, who were put in charge, became the boss of a business organization, and it failed because they didn't know how to lead. On the other hand, he's known more charismatic, inspirational leaders 
who were put in charge of a business organization who failed because they didn't know how to manage. Uh, and I'll personalize this uh, just a little bit. When I first uh, retired, I was recruited and I joined uh, a great uh, uh, corporation by the name of Northrop Grumman. And I had some uh, radio activity because my last job on active duty, I was the vice director of DISA. And as the vice director, as all vice directors of federal agencies do, you really run the organization, freeing the director up to work with higher ups and actually work the strategic relationships for the organization. And he and I had a great relation, personal relationship, so he had trust in me and and uh, I, I felt like that, uh, that uh, and he was a great leader, but he left the managing of the uh, agency uh, really up to me. So over time, um, I acquired a sufficient amount of skill in acquisitions, and in fact was the acquisition executive, uh, what we would call the, the uh, I was the decision authority on a lot of major contracts, such as Encore. Uh, Encore One was the first big IDIQ. By the way, everybody in DOD fought us over that. That'll never be a success. You can't have a 10-year contract. You can't have a, a, a $10 billion ceiling. You, you know, you, that's never gonna work well. I mean, how many large, broad, deep, billion dollar 10 year IDIQs do we have out there now? The proof, proof of the pudding there is that those are great contracting instruments and it gives a lot of companies a chance to play uh, because they have small business size and they have large business size and dozens of companies are involved in that in a prime role. So, so that worked out. But, but I thought managing this $8 billion budget uh, for DISA, uh, about six billion of it is uh, what they used to call the working capital fund. Is that what they still call it? And uh, that means that uh, we would make our case to the Department of Defense. They would issue us money in our budget. We had to sell our services to all the other agencies and military services within DOD and some uh, federal. And then we had to collect fees back from them and pay back the government, and this all had to happen every year. And that's uh, you know the theory behind working capital funds. If it only worked as well as you know it's designed, um, but in fact that's how. Uh, and I felt like I was pretty adept at understanding all of that, managing all of that, and, and pressing along. Imagine my surprise when I was recruited to come to Northrop Grumman on the basis of. Uh, you have radioactivity, so we're going to spend uh, the two years that you're really not available to approach DOD directly because of all these acquisitions where I had been the decision authority. Uh, the last thing you do before you retire is the lawyers all get together, review your decision history, and then they actually produce a letter to you that you have to show your future employers, and mine said, uh, General Bryan, you are not allowed to approach the Department of Defense directly for two years. Well, yet still, Northrop Grumman recruited me, understanding that. That doesn't mean you can't work in the background. You just can't have that direct face-to-face -face, uh, uh, proposition. So how did, uh, what did they do with me? Well, the first thing they told me was, we're going to make you uh, one of our future leaders here in Northrop Grumman, uh, our intention is to make you a group president someday. So we're hiring you as a vice president. Uh, and I said, well, that's pretty heady stuff. Uh, I was the, uh, also the IT sector representative on the corporate strategy team, which I really enjoyed. It gave me a chance to get to know the leadership of Northrop Grumman. Ron Sugar was the CEO in those days. Wes Bush was the president, but we all knew he was going to be the future CEO. He has since turned that over to uh, Kathy, uh, I forget her name, but now the, uh, the new CEO. But Wes Bush was, went from being a group president to the president of the corporation to the CEO of the corporation during the time that I was a part of the company 
and a part of their corporate strategy team. But let me tell you that the shock that I got was that I was in the IT sector. I was the deputy to the, to the sector president. And I, for about five weeks after I got there, I sat in on almost every meeting that the sector president took. And about 75% of the meetings were either with people who caused it, came from a part of the sector called business development, which I did not really know what that term meant, and, and or finance. And after five weeks of sitting through meetings, primarily with those groups of people, I had to go to him and say, I think you should fire me. He said, what? What are you talking about? And I said, I've been to every meeting almost that you have had with business development and, and finance folks now uh, for about five weeks, and I haven't understood a thing that was talked about. I didn't understand the language. I was totally unprepared to be a manager inside a corporate setting. And I wasn't in a position, I was the deputy to the, to the senior leader of the, of the sector, so I was really uh, in, in a position of being uh, be seen but not heard. Because frankly, uh, I didn't have anything to offer. I had no words of wisdom unless somebody would say, well, we're thinking about approaching DISA in this way, what do you think? Or we are thinking about approaching the Army with this idea, what do you think? Well, I had some value to add to that discussion. But when they started talking about EBITDA and margins and rate pools and all of that stuff in finance, and when they started talking about uh, the details of calculating a, a, a P-win for a, uh, and writing a proposal and why are the proposals in multiple volumes and what goes into a volume and what's a good proposal and what's a not, not a good proposal, I did not have a clue as to what they were talking about. So when I finished my little, so I'm prepared to be fired. And he said, I've been waiting for this conversation because I knew that you didn't know any of this. So come back tomorrow and bring me a plan of self-development, self-learning, self-training. What do you need to do to get smart about how we manage business? So I came back and I said, you need to send me to the Shipley School so I understand what business development is all about, and what step, uh, step presentations are, how you qualify an opportunity, what does it mean to go into capture, and, and what are uh, being P dollars, and I had to learn all of that. Well, you learn that by going to school and then talking to the people in your organization and listening to them uh, to hear and, and you learn from them. I sat in the contract shop for about a week, just observing and, and eventually, you know, pulling my chair up next to, to uh, the, the very, very expert people who worked in contracting, trying to understand why, why is this so complicated? Well, it's because of the federal acquisition regulation. Well, what's that? I've read it. I mean, they. They said, when, when you've done your homework, come back and waste some more of my time. Uh, so, so I did. I sat in with the CFO, and she laboriously took great care and patience with me, sometimes long into the night, going through spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet, because everything was on an Excel spreadsheet. That's how finance people work, right? until I could actually ask an intelligent question and actually understand what, what all this was saying. I mean, it's one thing at DISA when they would bring me the financial management tools and everything was, uh, as long as it was printed in black ink, I understood that was good. When red ink showed up, I knew that something wasn't right. And, uh, but in the business world, it's not nearly that simple. And so I had to learn how to do that. So it took me about two years, and um, during that two years, though, I, I continued to work with uh, Wes Bush and the other corporate strategy team members. 
And we developed a strategy that was very close hold. It was all done um, on the East Coast in Norfolk uh, in, a, in a sort of a secret place. And none of us were allowed to ever divulge to anybody, including our sector bosses, what we were recommending. You know, first, we had to assess the situation, have a, develop a vision for the future based on guidance from Wes Bush, who was going to be the CEO someday. Um, and to make a long story about the strategy short, we, we put together this strategy for the future, moved the headquarters from LA to Northern Virginia, sell ships, Ingalls uh, Shipyard and um, Hampton Roads in Norfolk, uh, combine some sectors together. You gotta remember, Norfolk Grumman, like a lot of large corporations, didn't just grow from a single company. In the early to mid 90s, they went on an acquisition binge because they found out that the planes that they were building uh, were uh, relics of the past. It was past thinking. And it wasn't until they decided to develop the future bomber, the, the Delta Wing bomber. Was that the B-2? Yeah. That was a North, that's a Northrop Grumman airplane, right? So, um, But to get to that, where we could do that again, they had to acquire companies that really had the expertise in doing that. So we had sectors, the way they did it was they would buy these companies and they would just snap it all together and everybody became their own sector. It was not at all, unusual. and I had observed that sometimes when I was the vice director at DISA, I would have three appointments with Northrop Grumman on the same day and they were from three different sectors and they were competing with each other. And so uh, it was clear to me that we could get some efficiency. So we tried to do away with the culture of TRW, which had been bought by Northrop Grumman, with uh, PRC Lytton, which had been acquired, with Logicon, who had been acquired, uh, on and on and on and on, with Westinghouse Electronics, which had been acquired, uh, the people who built all the radar systems for all of the um, uh, war machines of, of our country. So uh, anyway, I got to know Wes Bush and well enough that uh, after one of our meetings with him as a strategy team, he said, uh, Dave, how about staying back just for a few minutes uh, for a private chat? Now, I, you know, you'd think, well, is, am I going to get my walking papers? What's he going to talk to me about? What he wanted to talk about was leadership. He said, I want you to do a private study and analysis for me. I want to know why we hire all of these flag officers who are retiring to come into Northrop Grumman. And more than 90% of them leave in less than three years. Why do they fail? These are great leaders. Why are they failing as business leaders? More than 90% of the flag officers. Turns out this wasn't just true of Northrop Grumman. The difference was, and what, what my sector president had wisely done was recognizing they didn't know how to manage a business. And so he, was, he said, Bill O'Neill, uh, who was my sector boss, has told me what you've gone through over the past year of learning to be a business manager. And he said, I'm really encouraged by that, so I think you're the right one to do this study. But the results when I went back to him were shocking. How many great military leaders said, this isn't for me, and they either resigned or, or were let go after somewhere around the two-year mark. But 90% were gone within three years. Now, that's a heck of a cost to hire somebody in, put them in a senior leadership position, but give them a set of tasks which required them to be great managers, and they failed. They could manage a military organization, but they didn't know how to manage a business organization. So we actually developed a training program, if you will, boot camp, for senior leaders who need management training, and it was a lot very similar to the one that I had put myself through with 
with my boss's uh, guidance. Uh, and that, uh, two years later, that number was down to 20%. Because suddenly, uh, and it wasn't optional for senior leaders to go into this program. Uh, welcome aboard, welcome to Northrop Grumman, here's your training program. <laughs> and a year from now, uh, we'll consider putting you into a situation where your leadership skills uh, your ability to inspire, motivate, have vision, um, and lead people will be matched by your management skill, understanding business development, contract management, financial management, uh, how to win, uh, how to compete in the business world. So that brings us to our practical exercise here. Now, uh, Jamie did a great job. In fact, the chart that he showed uh, of the overlap is really central to this exercise. Uh, he sort of let the cat out of the bag. This is about deciding how do you measure success as the total exceptional leader that is inside you that we want to help you recognize. Well, if you can't measure your success, how do you know you're successful? Um, in military organizations, how do you know you're successful? Well, you accomplish the military mission, you get a good efficiency report, uh, maybe you get a medal. Um, those are the kinds of ways uh, in military. So I want you to sort of step outside that, if you're caught in that sort of uh, paradigm, and think a little bigger. Think more in terms of the uh, the example of the heart and the head, that, that was a great discussion, by the way. But think in terms of the skills that exceptional leaders have, the characteristics that they have, on the one hand, and the skills and uh, uh, abilities that exceptional managers have. Because the true exceptional leader today and into the future is the one who can measure success and lead people to success using both sets of skills. And so the exercise here is all about, first of all, taking everything that you've learned, everything perhaps you've read, if you've read my paper by now, if you uh, have your own experiences uh, to pull, fall back on, put down the three ways an exceptional leader measures success by, and on the other side, an exceptional manager measures success by. And be conscious of the fact that in some of these, there's overlap. <laughs> yep, we can. Can you do that for us, Chris? Yeah, put uh, the, the overlap. The Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, no fair copy. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Chris will get it up here in just a second. He has to swap over. That's important. There it is. Okay, so as a great exceptional leader, how do you, what are the three characteristics that are most important in your group's opinion, and how would you measure success? And the same thing on manage. What are the three, pick three, three that you think, you know, one, two, three most important aspects or characteristics, uh, skills, and how do you measure success there? And the degree to which they overlap really will be apparent when the groups all brief back. When you see the diagrams go on the wall, you'll find that uh, we'll measure success for session two uh, on how well uh, a lot of this comes together. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's take about, uh, we've got about uh, 15 minutes to work on this. I've got uh, 
27 after the hour. We'll take 15 minutes to work on this in groups. So let's number off again. One, two, three. Where'd Stephen go? One, two, three. One, two, three, four. So this is a group. I, I, I confused everybody earlier. <laughs> we'll just geographically make this a group. Oh, we'll make Julie part of four, this group, from Stephen to, to Judy. And then the, the uh, three amigos uh, over here, okay? Okay, good. Start the clock.
the geographies, yes. I'm from no, Utah and Colorado, so, so I live more in Aurora. My family's in Minnesota, so Colorado's over there. Yeah. So Littleton is where I was at. Well, Highlands Ranch. So that's funny because my first two jobs.
from my from my place. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Okay, I hate to interrupt, but we have to move on here and provide some time. Y'all ready? Good. So um, we'll try to get out of here uh, as close to being on time as we can. Uh, I hate to interrupt all of the uh, uh, session work that's going on. It's really great to see. Um, and we have a few people. In there. There's Nicolette. There we go. Nicolette, now we just need Jerome. I don't know where he got off to. So since he's not back yet, we'll start over here. How about that? Re right. Some feedback, report, report out? Okay. We've got, um, for our leader, we've got morale. That's the, uh, the measure of success. Um, would you like to come up or would you like to sit down? Yeah, the ability to increase morale, basically, for the people that work with, with us. Um, for manager, uh, increased output a measure of success, just what, whether revenue monetarily or uh, just uh, better production. We've got commitment um, uh, with, the, with the team, within the company and the culture that we want to, everyone have commitment to the job. And then uh, as a measure of success for manager, we've got team retention. People want to mm. stay on board and work together. And the team, um, for leader, another uh, leader success measure is team cohesion. So having the ability to control your, your team and uh, work together again. And then another measure of success for management would be upward mobility in the sense of promotions, advancement, and I think that that means rewards and stuff. Rewards, oh, you're right. Rewards, awards. Mm -hmm. I, think yep. there was, I think there was some consensus around if we were picking words off the screen that <laughs> culture and vision under leadership and, uh, and measure, act to just repeat, which is probably the agile framework, and us speaking um, were things that most of the rest of us were. Are you a scrum master? I think so. <laughs> well, so am I. Uh, I love the, uh, uh, the Agile framework. That's great. That's great. Uh, so what do you think? What do you think? How about giving them some feedback? <laughs> I warned you there'd be, open, there'd be some commonality. Let me ask you this um, <clears throat> to the group. This issue of morale, how do you really measure morale? Mm. If they back into their parking spot or whether they... You know, one of the great uh, stories, I think, of historic stories in baseball, of course, was the Nats this year. How they went from the worst record in baseball in mid-May and ended up winning the World Series. And 
the two real stars, really three I would pick, of that whole run were the three biggest introverts on the team. Aside from Baby Shark and all of that, because boy, I tell you, if you've never been in a stadium with 50,000 people like Jamie and I have been with Annette and seen 50,000 people start singing this kindergarten song <laughs> and doing the Baby Shark thing, it's so much fun. People couldn't wait for Para to come up. Uh, no, but there's plenty of YouTube out there. People, well, lots I, of people. I Thank you. So, but who were those three stars who were introverts? Howie Kendrick, the MVP of the National League pennant series with the, uh, with the Dodgers and then the Cardinals. Uh, very quiet guy. Uh, Anthony Rendon, the MVP candidate uh, for, at third base. I mean, there's no reason why he didn't win MVP this year. He had all the stats to go with it. You could hardly get him to talk in an interview. He, uh, he just was not one of those outgoing uh, people like that. Steven Strasburg, maybe the best pitcher in baseball uh, right now. Uh, incredible run this year. 18 wins, six losses, and all six losses were before June. Exactly. Great. Uh, um, The point, the point I'm trying to get here, here is that that team came together, all those different personalities came together, and they just had grit. And they really pulled together as a team. It, it, it's a perfect example of what we'll talk about in session six, uh, teamwork, about why the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But I would submit to you that that's leader work, and the manager was the leader of all of that. And he found the right formula and kept the faith in the face of perseverance. I mean, in May, they were, people were writing editorials to the paper to get him fired. And uh, next thing you know, he's the winning manager, Davey Martinez uh, uh, of the World Series. Uh, tremendous uh, story of leadership there and his ability to manage his team and get the right person in the right spot that the situation called for over and over and over again. You know, it was amazing. They, they were behind in almost every game, uh, with the exception of a few. I mean, they busted out seven runs in the first inning uh, in one game. But by and large, they would be going in the fifth or sixth inning, and they're just as happy-go-lucky in the dugout as they were. If they were seven runs up, it never seemed to phase them because they had such confidence that our team is going to come through, and they did, over and over and over, enough that they won the World Series. Great, great story, and I just had to tell at least one Nats story, because we're so proud of them. The secret now will be, though, how do you keep, because all three of those individuals that I named are all free agents. How well will the team's senior leadership and management, and by that I mean the owner, of the team and the president of baseball operations. How will they respond to a World Series title? And how well will they be able to hold this incredibly successful formula of this team together? That it remains to be seen. We may be telling a totally different story at next year's uh, leadership forum if they don't get it right. But so that's really uh, good. Thank you so much uh, for that input. Let's go to the next team.
You know, one of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, going back to my Northrop Grumman story, I never did get that group position because I was actually recruited away to Mantec. Uh, instead of waiting one more year to be a group person, I went right into Mantec and took over the, what was then called the Defense Systems Group. Uh, we had huge success there. It was so much fun. Uh, it was great working with George and Kevin. And uh, now Kevin, I guess, is the big boss there now. What's George's role there at Mantec? You might know? George Peterson? Because I felt like I was ready uh, as a leader and as a business manager, and they gave me an opportunity immediately. Whereas Wes Bush had said, we're going to move you to California in a year, and you're going to take over the space systems group in North Dakota. I didn't have to wait a year. I mean, it really was, I was ready. I felt like I was ready. And that's what I wanted to really do was be a, a business leader. And then uh, then after three years uh, or so of Northrop Grumman and several years at Mantec, then I uh, started my own consulting business. But um, that's what I wanted to do. And so that got me there to my personal goal uh, a year earlier. And it was pretty good salary. I mean, there's always money involved, right? It's always in the equation. But, uh, but it primarily was, it was, uh, well, yeah, but um, it would have been a year later. Yeah, I should have had you as my <laughs> negotiator. I had to make a pretty quick decision. The, the reason Mantech wanted me right then, right there, I mean, it was, th things happen in life, and not all of them are great, right? Sometimes life isn't fair. A very, very good friend of mine was in that job, and he had been diagnosed with stage four cancer and was dying. And he had gone to George and said, you need to meet uh, Dave Bryan. He's the guy you need to pick to replace me in the job. So there was that ingredient of a very good friend. So when I get the call from George Peterson, let's have lunch, uh, I said, sure. I did not know that at the time, but I, I knew that later. It, it became part of how could I say no, kind of. So there was an extra degree of that. Okay, let's go to the uh, next group. Who's up? Okay, great. Okay, any feedback? Jamie?
Thank you very much. That, that's great. Uh, when I was, uh, I won't name uh, the company, but I was consulting to a large company when I, right, I first, I don't work with large companies anymore, just uh, small companies. But um, uh, when I first started my business, I needed to get going and I had an opportunity to consult with a large company. And so they invited me to their leaders offsite. And they spent a lot of money to bring in at dinner that night, um, the first day of the leaders offsite was all about spreadsheets and numbers. It was all about how to manage the business better. It wasn't anything about leaders. It wasn't anything about vision or strategy or uh, standards. or anything. It was just all about how much revenue, how much profit, and all the things that go into those uh, magic things we call spreadsheets uh, over time. Um, and that night, uh, they had they paid, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, he's known as the world's best salesman. Uh, can anybody help me out with that? The name escapes me right now. Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so Zig Ziglar was the speaker that night at this big you know, dinner. And he talks about productivity and results because of great leadership. And he was inspiring. And he was fact-based. And he told story after story after story of failures to do that and successes to do that in a way that if you've never heard him speak, that he has this rare talent uh, for speaking and, uh, uh, and just a... Uh, a really good guy, too. I had an opportunity to at least meet him and have a very brief conversation with him. And the president of the company got up, thanked him for it very much, and then turned to the back of the microphone and said, okay, let's get back to work. Ooh. Took the air right out of the room. And I thought, God almighty, what a failure. As a leader, this moment, he could have vaulted them into, uh, but the offsite wasn't about leadership, even though they call it the leader's offsite. It was all about management and improving efficiencies and cutting costs. That was how they were going to become more profitable. Therefore, a greater return on shareholder value by cutting costs. Nothing about leadership. So when I had my chance to, uh, after the offsite, and uh, I went to my meeting with this uh, leader and he said, because he wanted feedback from the offsite. What did I think? So, so, so and so and I said, I think you missed the moment. Well, yeah. Tell the truth. Sometimes it's painful. And it, it rocked him. He said, what? I said, you missed a moment to vault your organization forward. Can you imagine making your numbers the way you are and you're not exhibiting any leadership at all? You're managing this company to make its numbers in a way that you understand. Think of how much more your company could do, how much more if the people were motivated if they loved coming to work, if they were confident that you actually had a vision of the future and had taken the time to tell them what it is, and the vision was something bigger and better than simply more profit. I said, you missed a moment. You had all of your managers at your leader's offsite in the room with you, and you missed an opportunity to tell them what your vision for the organization going forward that will result in greater opportunity, greater revenue, uh, reasonable margins to remain competitive, which will generate even more net profit. I mean, you, you could have transformed, begun a transformation process in which the word would get out and people who are hugely successful all over, all over would be clamoring to join your organization. 
I said, how many calls have you gotten from outside your company in the last 30 days from somebody saying, man, I want to be in that. I want to be there. He said, well, none. I said, there's your measure. There's your metric. You missed an opportunity. What can we do about it? Well, uh, I have said this to private business owners. You probably ought to step down as the CEO of your company and, and do something different inside your company and put somebody inside in charge uh, as the CEO who is both a, an exceptional leader and an exceptional manager and when combined together is a dynamo. <clears throat> Fully fits the, the definition of exceptional leader. Has all the right qualities, has a value framework that's consistent with uh, the things that you say are important in the company, et cetera, et cetera. When you're talking to somebody who's the CEO of a publicly traded company, um, that's, it's a little bit different kind of conversation there. Um, what's interesting is three months later, I got a call from guess who? No. <laughs> the chairman of the board of that company. He said, uh, uh, how did the offsite go? I think he missed a moment. He missed an opportunity. He said, I do too. We're going to make a change. We want to retain you as part of our search team because you seem to know the leader we need in that business. We're no longer content with simply making the numbers that keeps Wall Street semi-satisfied. We look for somebody who can vault us forward. And maybe I'm overusing that term, but it is possible to do leaps if you have the right leadership because well-led organizations are capable of things they never thought possible. Okay. We've had a great first day, I think. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, the people who didn't make it in here, they're missing out. Maybe some of them will drift in tomorrow. I hope you can, Israel, make, make it so. You're missing out by not coming in the mornings as well. Uh, so we start in the morning. Uh, what time, Sean? Um, actually, the, the room will be open at 0700, 7 p.m. For everybody else, the breakfast is at 730. So if you want to come drop your stuff up here first, that's fine. But if you could be up in your seats at the um, leadership forum table, still in the top of the ballroom by 720, that would be great. And we'll come over here after. Which, by the way, if you haven't heard him speak before, Admiral London, the Coast Guard, um, Admiral for the 14th District Coast Guard here, is a phenomenal, very engaging speaker. So please make sure you're in time not to miss that tomorrow. Look at him and see what he talks about in terms of leaders and managing. Because he's an exceptional leader. When is the uh, Palhana? It is tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening. They've moved it to Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other housekeeping things before we... Oh, so you were the first one to actually introduce yourself today. So Yeah, we never did actually yeah. do that because this morning we got off to a bit of a different kind of start. Usually... Yeah, Amy did oh, that. Yeah. That's true. Well, if people feel the need, yeah, we can yeah. do that. Uh, I did have one last thing. Um, who's a really good golfer? Nobody? <laughs> no. Are you talking basketball? Yeah, we are. We are. It's tempting to think to say who's a good golfer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> who golfs? Is that the question? Who golfs? Yeah, maybe that's a better... Probably an open bar or something out there. 
Well, on the exhibit floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Circles some of them talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Every, yeah, not every vendor does, but they were already prepping. Maybe they start about an hour or so. Yeah. So, yeah. Tuesday night tends to be party night. As the lunch was today. Yeah, so 7 to 20, I was going to drop your stuff off here before, and then the door will be open at 7 tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah, uh, you can leave your. You can leave your here, yeah. yeah, you can leave your um, notebooks, your binders. Yeah, yeah, the room will be locked up tonight. Okay? All right, good. We'll see you in the morning.